the way we conduct ourselves in our life, personal lives, but also in our businesses, uh, microeconomic changes and macroeconomic changes. And, um, we, and we all thought that we would like to have someone who has guided a company through a period of momentous change. And Mr. Lakshmi Narayanan, uh, when he took over the helm of uh, Cognizant, it was um, doing, um, and I'm reading from the statistics, which are truly remarkable. It was doing a, a revenue of 300 million, and uh, he lifted it to one and a half billion dollars. So uh, he is someone who clearly knows how to successfully navigate the winds of change. Uh, he has been the chairman of NASCOM. His achievements are so many that uh, I will um, eat into his time, and he has instructed me to be extremely brief. So. Uh, uh, thank you so much, sir, for taking the time for us, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Srinath, and uh, very happy to be talking to all of you. First of all, congratulations to, to you, Bhaskar, Hari, and the entire team for having completed 15 years. Uh, to build on the reputation and to keep the culture and the reputation it's very, very important. Uh, congratulations. Uh, yes, we are going through difficult times. It's not as though this is the first time that we are going through these type of change and difficulties. We have had very many challenges in the past. I'll, somehow I'll talk about it in the context of Cognizant. Uh, but this change is very different. Earlier challenges were some of them were localized geographically. Some of them affected us only professionally. Some of them affected us only socially or personally. But this is something that is global. The pandemic that I'm talking about, it's global. Uh, it impacts us professionally, personally, socially. It's so many different ways that we are still trying to grapple with it. And for many of us who are still holding a job, who have a work, which itself is a, is a, is a great accomplishment, uh, work and the workplace has become so different. Working from home is not something that we're used to. Work and workplace are, uh, that's what gives us meaning for us. That's the, uh, you know, like that Esther Perel mentioned, that's our belonging. That's where the connections are made. That's our identity. That's where we learn from peers. That's our uh, self-development. That's where the growth is. So suddenly we don't find a workplace to go to and we are having to work from home. So emotionally, we are kind of invested in work and the workplace, and that's kind of been snatched away, and that we are coming to grips with. It's a big change. Uh, it's a change almost overnight, and it's a change that we have uh, embraced. But we are still not accepted to it. We are in the process of that. So that adapt adaptation will take quite some time but surely we will have to adopt to the, to the new area. And working from home is something that was somewhat familiar to people like us in the IT industry, but it is uh, over encompassing at this point of time. And it is not just working from home. It is, it's more like working with home now. In addition to the professional tasks that you have that you have to accomplish from home, you also have to accomplish various other, various other domestic duties, parenting, uh, you know, partnering, whole lot of other things that we have to come to grips with. So it's clearly somewhat of a challenging time for all of us. In addition, we miss the people, we miss the touch, uh, we miss the laughter together, we miss socially engaging. So this is, uh, this is going to be a tremendous challenge. And let's see if we have some lessons from the past that we can learn from and help us navigate us through this. Earlier, I mentioned about cognizance challenges through the several changes that we went through. I'll probably take them in the chronological order and uh, just talk about what the challenge at each time was and uh, what is the learning, how did we navigate that and see if that has some lessons for today's context. Uh, just to set the overall context of where we are as a company, Cognizant has grown, it has seen its ups and downs. Uh, it's uh, $17 billion in terms of revenue now. Uh, among the top five companies, third in terms of revenue. Globally, if you look at our category of companies, Accenture is number one with uh, more than $40 billion in revenue. 
TCS is number two with about $21 billion in annual revenue. Then uh, Cognizant is in the third place with uh, about $17 billion in revenue. Then we have Capgemini at about 15, Infosys at 13, HCL, Wipro, et cetera, make up their remaining order. So that's the overall context, 300,000 plus employees, huge organization. Now, when we started, we never imagined that this is the way the company will pan out to be. Uh, this is started in the year 1994. And for the first two or three years, it was just initial foundation growing up until we got listed in 1998, uh, which is when it is really the company gained some maturity. And immediately after listing, uh, the challenges started. We are accountable to investors, we are accountable to analysts, the markets, et cetera. And that was the beginning of the learning and also to some extent beginning of challenges because around the same time that we listed, the listing itself was a, uh, you know, the scheduled listing was to happen in May, 1998, a week, week before the uh, listing in uh, NASDAQ in the US, a uh, week or 10 days before, uh, there was this nuclear, peaceful nuclear explosion that was carried out in India. So the lead bankers walked out and said that this Indian-based company is not going to have any hope here. So please postpone it. So we said, you know, we've invested a lot of time and effort. We cannot postpone. We have to go ahead. We'll probably postpone by two, three weeks or a month. But the IPO is something that we cannot cancel or postpone to the following year. So that's, that's how the, the company was born in the, in the public domain uh, during a challenging time. But then immediately thereafter, we had a great opportunity, which was the year 2000 remediation in terms of computers. You know, some of you may be familiar with this. You know, I think most of you are probably too young to remember what happened. And that was a great time when people like us used to go about threatening all the people, instilling fear in all the corporates saying, on December 30, 1999, you know, your business will collapse. You're, you're in an elevator and the elevator will suddenly midnight and you wouldn't know unless you fix the computer systems because computers are driving everything. So out of fear, many people, many of course, opened their first strings and we made a big kill in that period of high growth. It was also the period that we realized that the biggest challenge in terms of uh, connection, in terms of uh, getting talent. Am I breaking up or am I okay? I don't know. Many of you won't be able to answer. At least one of you. You're perfectly fine, sir. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Thank you. So that was the time that we realized that we're growing tremendously. Uh, we're chasing growth, but our internal systems, et cetera, are in shambles. We're not able to get the necessary support in terms of systems, in terms of HR, in terms of talent acquisition, in terms of developing products, et cetera, et cetera. We really struggled during that period. So the first lesson that we learned then was how do we prepare for success? You know, constantly we are preparing for failure. Oh, because there this way to happen now protected do we have enough in the bank it's a but we for success so every time thereafter said every year we'll have to look at while we plan for contingencies uh, we have to really also plan for success suppose enormously successful type of challenge and how do we get ourselves ready for it first big learning around 1999 What's the later half of 1999? And that came in very handy because the next big opportunity that we had was the which we started participating in. Because we are for success, you know, we were one of the early adopters and uh, we really grew again rapidly during that period until the whole thing came crashing down. We knew about innovation, we knew we had to be fast. We kind of recruited all kinds of talent from anywhere and everywhere in the world in order to be ready for that. But the whole thing collapsed in a matter of weeks. And that was another the big learning, saying that while you prepare for success, you'll have to also prepare for failure in a, in a very, very different way. Uh, and that's when really it's only after that the company realized how important it is to take care of talent in terms of getting them to innovate getting them to be part of the overall organization from true spirit and empowering them. You know, until then it was a few leaders who were in the industry, who had a lot of experience, 
who would say that this is the way to build this organization, this is the way to go, this is the way to set standards, this is the quality process, etc. But that's when the realization came, hey, this is a new technology, we've got to empower, we've got to get people to innovate, the leaders will have to step back and loosen the reins and give it to some of the younger people in the organization. And the motivation for many of them, which is predominantly financial at that point of time, that's something that we have to take care of. So that's when the whole HR structure took a completely different, particularly the compensation related structure, because people were innovating. They were coming up with new ideas, platforms, et cetera. And that's not going to, that wasn't going to lead to immediate revenues or immediate benefits. The benefit of those innovations were to be realized over the longer period of time with a high degree of risk. Some of it could be realized. Many of those ideas and investments that we make may not even result in anything for the company. So that's when the stock option program was introduced or reintroduced in a strong manner, where if there are people who are innovating, there is no point compensating them immediately because it's not adding to the bottom line of the company at that point in time. But this innovation could be a huge kicker in the future years. So let's reward them with options so that if the company does well in the future, they get that benefit. So that, those are the type of schemes that uh, we put in place that attracted a lot of uh, fantastic talent. It was in a brief period, in a period of about 12 months, we had this done. And by the middle of year 2001, we were sailing happy. You know, everything was going on all right. We were respected in the market, et cetera. And then the next big change came, 9-11. Big disaster. And we had close to about 75%, Cognizant had a business of 75% of the revenues coming from customers in the US. And that was a big shock. You know, we didn't know that, uh, I mean, for a period of about two to three weeks, we just didn't know what's going to happen. And for people like me, I just, just two, three days before the actual, uh, the twin tower bomb and explosion uh, took place, I was in an adjacent building, the JP Morgan Chase building, finished the meeting, took the flight, came back, come here and watch the TV and this is what's happening. So. It was, it was such a huge change. And it took us a uh, whole of, that was the first ever quarter where we had a declining revenue when we you know, announced the results. So the big learning then was how to be prepared for business contingency, BCP, disaster recovery, and uh, all the type of investments that we had to make. So that's the, also the time we went to the market and said, you don't expect this company to quarter after quarter results, I mean, uh, delivering better and better results as far as the bottom line is concerned, because we are going to fix the bottom line. We'll deliver growth, but we will make more money, but we are going to fix our margins at a low level. And anything above that level, we are going to invest in the business. We need to invest in the business because we have to create disaster sites, we have to get talent, we have to prepare for the future. Uh, we have to prepare for business contingency, et cetera, et cetera. So don't expect us to be like the other companies which are delivering fantastic margins. Our margins are going to be low, but instead we'll deliver growth for you at a stable margin. And that was something that took some time for the analysts to understand, but then they understood it and we had been consistently performing after that, uh, empowering the people, delivering good results, growing at the rate of anyway from 60 to 100% year after year. A period of growth, uh, which, is, which is phenomenal. And that's around the time that the young people in the company were also getting impatient. Many young, highly talented people, highly technology-oriented people who, were, uh, who wanted growth. It was not as though only Cognizant was growing. There were plenty of other companies where also that were growing. And there were opportunities and pull factor from outside that was trying to attract talent from inside the company. So there are a few things that we did around that time, again, related to people, people management. And one of the significant things that we did then was to uh, lower the retirement age. We said, at least in India, where we have the flexibility, you know, overseas markets, there is nothing like a retirement age. So people can retire whenever they want, and as long as they are wanted in the company, they can work whether they are 60, 65, 70. Whereas in India, there was that retirement age, uh, age and being a public private company, or a private sector company, we had the option. We said people will have to retire at the age of 55, 
Uh, that will make room for younger people to get into leadership positions. And this retirement was different. You know, it's not as though your retire means you stop coming to work. You have to hand over the responsibility to the, the next person in line, by which time you should have developed another person to take over your responsibility. And then you keep coming to the office, your office will be there, your staff will be there. If you're getting benefits from the company, all those things will be there, but you won't get your options, you won't get your bonus, but you can enjoy working with the team, teaching, training, mentoring, etc. That that worked out reasonably well. It continues to work. That's a practice that we are uh, following. Uh, I understand even today. So I was the I was the first victim of that policy. So I retired in the age of uh, the age of two, and the the year two thousand seven, uh, and then uh, you know, fortunately because at that point of time I was uh, I was in the board. So continued to be the uh, the vice chairman in the board. I used to spend a fair amount of time in the firm, but also spent a lot of time outside, outside the firm. And then the culture was established. Culture was one of the most important things that we always used to think about. Culture of integrity, culture of customer focus, culture of delivering, uh, culture of doing whatever it takes in order to meet a commitment. You know, we used to say, what is, what is integrity? Integrity is the promise, fulfilling the promise, come what may. Words plus action, that is integrity. So very, very good. You know, the culture was very well uh, defined. And uh, I mean, how do you develop? You develop culture based on uh, the leaders exhibiting those culture. You uh, people, a large company particularly, they look up to their leaders. They learn from them. It's the behavior that is exhibited by the leaders that forms the culture. And that goes down the line. And also the behavior that they tolerate in the company. You tolerate mediocrity. Gone, you know, it's accepted. If you tolerate uh, shortcuts, again, that will become the norm very soon. So intolerance to all those type of things. So that was established very well, doing extremely well, which is when the next big shock came, which is the global financial crisis. Again, a huge, uh, huge impact. Just as during the 9-11, we were, had 75% of our business coming from the North America, during the global financial crisis, about 45% of our revenues are coming from business and financial sector customers. Big impact. So that was the second quarter in our history at that point in time where we reported a sequential decline in revenue growth. Uh, it was very uncertain. We just didn't know what was going to happen at that point in time. Uh, there again, the big learning was because we had a good strong balance sheet, we had a lot of money, we had not compromised on our margins. So we kept it low. We had enough buffer. Uh, we had something like three, $4 billion of cash at that point in time. So we said, let's help our banking customers. Let's not worry about whether they'll pay our bills or not. We don't really care. This is the time to help our financial services customer. Let's go all out and help them. Which is something that we did effectively in the years 2009 and 2010. I remember instances where uh, I think there was one bank, Wells Fargo, which was acquiring another very weak or failing bank. Wells Fargo was also failing, but it was not in as bad a state as a bank, uh, Wachovia, which is in the East Coast, that was failing. So these guys decided to integrate and all the systems had to be integrated. Whenever this mergers take place, the one or two things that they always look at is, uh, is the culture consistent between the two companies? Are the systems compatible? So in this particular case, the culture was compatible uh, to, to a large extent. Systems were compatible, but they, uh, the performance was very varied. Uh, Wells Fargo, which had several product lines, they on an average used to sell something like, uh, may not have the right numbers, 4.6 or 4.7 products for every customer that they had. Very high, very high degree of cross-selling. Whereas Wachovia had something like 2.3. So... Wells Fargo came to us. Both of them were uh, customers of us. They said, we are going to do this merger. We don't have the money. The target for all of us is once merged, we want to be in a position where for every customer, we are able to cross sell at least 3.6 products, you know, somewhere in between. You know, we had never worked on that type of a business goal and a business outcome. This is really something you can target the senior leadership and EVP of a bank or a EVP marketing in a bank or a line of business with that type of a target, but not a partner like us who's 
only technology focused with very little backing backing in the in the domain uh, but that was interesting we took that challenge because there was there was nothing else to do so let's jump into it let's learn and work that that proved to be successful that really proved out to prove to be successful and uh, that's when we learned the value of relationship how do you build relationship what is it that you need to do in times of crisis etc it's that relationship model that got perfected at that point in time where we wanted you know we should stop stop selling stop spending money on marketing and sales but have our customers sell us effectively that was truly accomplished during that time so it was a it was a great ride a fantastic ride growing we meeting everyone uh, we were almost like the benchmark if cognizant says this this is what is going to happen to the industry we were in many areas the leading benchmark for many other sectors and it was around that time 2004 2005 the global uh, i mean 2014 and 15 that the slowdown in the sector started in the slowdown because there was a big technology change people started talking about uh, smack social mobile analytics and cloud computing uh, the companies that were respected at that time were not the service companies like us but uh, facebook a uh, google microsoft instagram linkedin there are so many new players and so many views of i mean ways of going directly into the customers that uh, you know the business models kept changing amazon was doing well ebay was doing well and uh, the growth uh, started slowing down for the entire sector you know when when a slowdown happens that's when you kind of start making the mistakes and that's when we be, uh, also become vulnerable uh, so we were vulnerable at that point of time and one of the uh, things that happened at that point of time was an activist investor came in and invested money quietly in the background got to a stake level where they could dictate some terms so the uh, that we continued the philosophy of investing our net margin will be only 20% we had a, a lot of money uh, for a 5 billion dollars in the balance sheet uh, we had not paid any dividend people investors would ask you know what are you going to do with the money we say you no know, this is a long term business we need this ammunition for growth in the future so we are not going to give away any money then came elliot and said your growth is slowing down they are across the sector so the growth is slowing down you are going to be like any other company so what are you going to do with all the money that you have we want a dividend policy we want you to return capital or buy back shares we want you to get away from this fixing this margin at 20% we have to improve or increase it to beyond 20% we have to be like all the other companies at that point in time our uh, immediate competitors like infosys tcs had a margin of 25% you know we'll have to gradually get towards that no amount of our trying to convince them saying that hey those guys will also come down to about 22 levels because this is the the long term name they said no because they had certain short term goals and they were changes they introduced a couple of new directors in the board etc etc that was a that was a difficult time it was a difficult time uh, because we this was not something that we had prepared for but we managed through that but that's it's during that period that we made a, a number x because we were not completely in control of the business uh, there was someone else also who was trying to who was sitting very close to the driver seat and take control or trying to dictate so that was one big challenge we realized that this is something that may happen in the future also so put together some long term policy we said okay this is what the investors want we'll start giving dividend so i think in the year 2016 onwards we started giving dividend and that is something that is continuing same level of dividend something like 20 or 25 cents per share every quarter throughout uh, the last 4 or 5 years that's continuing so that has to some extent drained the resources that we had uh, and around the same time we had this legal challenge legal challenge of uh, a corruption case that came up uh, it was a question of you know we are in, in uh, investing in infrastructure in the firm. building buildings uh, creating millions of square feet of space and suddenly you know there was a building that had been constructed and it to occupy and 18 months it hadn't been occupied uh, and suddenly the audit committee looked at 18 months this has been because you haven't got permission complete some money on that building what's happening 
Uh, that's when you got it and they said you know this this money is not being spent on the infrastructure it is going for some and the moment they learnt it the audit company uh, any um, and given the culture the integrity with which the business they immediately reported to department of justice and department to the legal people that said hey, there is something that is going on that's not right as per fc uh, pa it's a uh, confused between fcr afcpa one of those this is act uh, and then the legal guys came in legal guys came in and it's something that is still going on the company was absolved company spent more than i would say more than 50 million dollars it was a key uh, i mean for getting the building completion certificate not the certificate uh, uh, some uh, uh, payments to the tuna Two to two to three million dollars had been paid, uh, but the consequence of that was the company ended up losing about two hundred fifty million dollars by way of legal fees, penalties, etc., etc. So that also, you know, impacted the people to a very large extent. You know, it was a great reputed company. People used to take a great pride in what they were doing. Uh, well, everyone, hey, yeah, this is this normal. You guys. why did you report it and this is something that is very very every day in the indian context but that's something that as a us listed company we could stop and the consequence of that, i think we continue to experience but what it does was uh, to be doubly sure to be even more care to be even more uh, 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 cautious in all the that we do uh, the real estate program completely until we put all the process in place which is which is because we no longer in fact we are a whole lot of real estate that we have at this point in time so these are these are all types of challenges that we went through the major ones and uh, running a large corporation like this we have day to day challenges bulk of which is technology related and people related and preparing strategically for the future Now, one of the things that uh, we didn't prepare strategically for the future was in 2016 17 when all this digitization was taking ground we knew that we talked about smack we knew about future of work in fact there are people in the company who took a leadership position role and published books on the future of work future workplaces how would they would be etc but then we didn't follow that up with investments and changing our business model and no one else did you know that was also another factor but the moment it was realized that this is going to be the future and the changes are going to happen far more rapidly there were some companies in fact the largest company accenture was so nimble footed at that size that they said hey we missed the opportunity the only way we can catch up is by acquiring a whole bunch of other companies and build that capability and in one year they made something like 26 acquisitions and gained a leadership position in the digitization and uh, for us we couldn't do anything at that scale at that speed we started doing the acquisitions and now of course we are back to uh, where we wanted to be but then we lost a couple of years in that digitization process and we are building on that so it's another uh, important factor the misjudgment was technology is changing uh, digital is the way to go but we never thought it would dawn on us as rapidly as it did so now the learning is if there is any new idea new thing somebody talks about we won't wish it away we'll immediately jump and invest in that idea and then come back so that's the overall crisis and now the biggest challenge that we are going through is clearly the uh, the pandemic uh, but the sector this it sector has handled it really well in fact you know there are 4 million workers in this sector if you look at it in the indian and the overseas context where indian companies to take the top 10 companies uh, and look at the workforce globally 4 million people and the way within a matter of 3 to 4 weeks they adopted to working from home is phenomenal you know, so many of these people had to have their equipment moved from their offices there are i mean they have great stories the company called flyta flyta f l y t t a they do home moving they'll sign up with the company like accenture or tcs or infosys and say whenever people are transferred just leave it to us connect them we will move their belongings we'll find a place uh, we'll work with the packet packers and movers and move everything 
And during the crisis, there was no one who was moving. The biggest work that they did was moving equipment from office to people's homes, buying equipment and installing it in houses. Uh, and remote onboarding, people were hired and uh, they didn't have to come to the office to be signed in as an employee, but report from their home, they could be onboarded. So there are so many new innovations happened during this period. The government helped uh, IT, the Ministry of uh, IT declared this as an essential services, like the medical services, the ambulance services, etc. That's important for people to move about. So that gave us this thing. And so for the most part, it has worked out well. People were really looking forward to uh, this particular change because many of the people wanted to work from home. But of course, they realized that the challenges of working from home. But it's a, it's a big opportunity for us. We can bring down the cost. We have to invest a lot more in security. We can take work to where the people are. Earlier, when the bandwidth is available in significant amount, we used to talk about the depth of distance and working from home. Now this home can be in, uh, in Salem, it can be in Kumbakonam, it can be in uh, wherever remote parts, Ranchi, and you know, as long as connectivity is there, it would be great. So those are the type of opportunities that we are looking at, but we, of course, we'll miss the touch and feel in the short term. Hopefully, we'll learn, uh, and as they say, this, is, this has changed, our priorities will change, uh, our attitude to work is really going to change. People also will question their priorities and say, hey, do we need to really, do we really need all these luxurious items? Can we go back to minimalistic living? You know, we hear all kinds of reasons, all kinds of uh, debates that are going on among the workforce. Uh, but no solutions yet, no way forward. We're just waiting for the, we're just waiting for the uncertainty end, uncertainty to end so that we can make sense of what the future is going to be like and start preparing for it. So I'll stop here. Uh, this is the, the story in a nutshell. And uh, hopefully the learning that we have had will be of use to you also. Now I'm open to comments, questions, anything that you want to add to this. Thank you, sir. That was extremely uh, illuminating and wise words coming from somebody who's seen a couple of more cataclysmic changes than a few of us uh, have firm. So uh, I just want to, there are a few questions on the chat board. I'll just probably just take you through those questions and then uh, we can have a discussion. The first one is during these times of crisis, I know that this one is more unprecedented than each one is unprecedented, but this one more so than ever before. Do businesses and say professional services firms like us fall back on our core competence and deepen expertise in our areas? Or do you believe diversification is the way to go? Uh, and uh, in order to hedge the risks associated with uh, focus on any one particular area or areas of okay. practice of business? You know, it's, it's generally once you have reached a certain scale and you are a little more confident about the future, in the short term, you do that. In the short term, you tend to focus a little more sharply. You know, the normal the saying is uh, penetration is profit, uh, reach is cost. You know, if you want to preserve and get, preserve that profit, you go deeper into that particular area. But for the longer term growth, you need to have, you, know, you need to have multidimensional growth, growth in geographies, growth in number of clients, growth in the type of services, uh, growth in new ways of doing things, etc. So you'll have to reach out. Uh, that reaches, of course, cost. So in the short term, if, you're, if you have an uncertain future, you focus a little more on profit. But don't completely ignore the reach. Uh, you may be, uh, that may be less important, but continue to invest so that once you come out of it, you know, that's one of the things that we always say. If you're going to be focusing on penetration, uh, there is a separate innovation group, insulate them from the troubles of the company. Let them continue to work as though nothing has happened. That's the one of the lessons that we learned of preparing for success. Okay, this too shall pass. This problem will go away, but there is a big opportunity. Thank you. Sir. What what uh, Srinath uh, has a question now. Uh, what services, what changes do you foresee going forward in uh, people dependent uh, businesses of uh, such as law firms? Uh, 
do you see any uh, specific thing where technology is important but people are perhaps even more so um, do you anticipate any difference in the style of functioning or the changes that are likely to come about in such firms you know clearly there are a couple of changes that i can uh, say and uh, one is going digital applying technology very important you know whatever particularly the professional services firm and in the new world and the new way of working that's going to be quite important uh, some of the companies that have uh, adopted a different model uh, like for example wakil search i talk about 400000 clients small and medium businesses they say i can register and set up a business in a week's time or something like that it's uh, uh, it's they are building that's the foundation and their aspirations will clearly be to go up and up move from micro to small to medium to large enterprise customers and so that's something that is happening company called mike legal this is something that i just came across recently they are trying to use digital platforms technologies ai techniques to call out intelligence and insight from all the case studies and all the things that are required etc so it's important for uh, us to be aware of that and how to leverage technology to be more efficient to do more with less but for all professional services much more than strategy I always say the culture is very important also when you speak yeah when you speaking of culture so i are you using culture as inter- interchangeably with values or do you believe that a culture a cul- the culture of firm or an organization is different and it can evolve over a period of time um, and it can morph into uh, something else yeah it's i mean the culture encompasses values your beliefs etc you know it's a, it's an all encompassing thing there are the way to look at it is there is a there is culture there is strategy uh the strategy of the firm is maybe i want to be uh the number one firm or grow to a particular size at any cost okay so i can take shortcuts i can do any of this thing but if i say i want to get there but then i'll be guided far more by the culture of the firm and my reputation than by the goal or the strategy that i've set for myself so there it's it might appear to be conflicting but you know you'll have to experience it uh, i'm not able to explain that you'll have to experience that it is it is values it is what people will believe you to be if uh, culture what is the strength what is cognizant culture hey this guys will do anything for the customer customer focus is their culture that's it what is the what is the culture of a company like tcs oh they are the cost leaders and they are uh, highly technical tech leaders cost leaders that's the culture so everything if you go to them with a problem any problem hey they are my, my plumbing doesn't work at home they'll probably say hey, technology can solve that problem for you so that's the that's the the culture that is practiced in that company whereas a company like infosys is you know the culture is much more of a marketing positioning sales things of that nature yeah i think the next question um, i think there's one interesting question that we the one phrase that we keep getting uh to hear from time to time is things are never going to be the same in your view what are the major changes that we are witnessing that are here to stay and why and what are those that are going to fall away with the uh virus uh threat also going away yeah you know when you talk about you know people talk about new normal things are going to change etc but fundamentally all of them boil boils down to consumer behavior change that is it and everything is driven by that you may have corporate customers but the corporate customer that you are serving he is ultimately serving a consumer he is constantly worried about that consumer's change in behavior and that's what they want to do if if uh, people say hey, i this is a serious crisis i would much rather spend the money that i have on detol and not on uh, gucci perfume on luxury items what does that company have? what does lvmx do they say they cannot go back into sanitation i mean uh, the manufacturing of sanitizers they can do it in the short term but they have to bring the cult bring that customer behavior back to what their area of strength is so it is evaluating that how has the customer behavior changed or will change and how am i going to prepare my business so that i can reposition my product my service so that i'm still attractive still create that need still be relevant for that customer 
So it's, I mean, it may have different words. People may talk about reinventing oneself, reshaping the business, uh, reimagining your business, getting a new norm. But all that it means is at the bottom, customer behaviors are going to change. How am I adapting my business to meet the new customer needs? There was an interesting article that I, I saw. I got worried. Vishwanath and Anand had written. He is sitting in Germany, uh, longing to come back you know, to meet with the family. So he's missing the family quite a lot. And he's saying, hey, while I was in Chennai, uh, every three or uh, four today, I'll go to a restaurant and eat, eat out, go to movies, spend on uh, various things. So I'm sitting here. I'm not missing anything. I'm not missing any of those things. The only thing that I think about is I want to get back to family, spend time with my child. So once I go back, I'm going to go back into a minimalist type of living, spend a lot more time with family. So if millions of people start thinking about that, look what will happen to businesses. So that's the preparation that most people have to do. And that's going to have an indirect impact on legal firms like you as well, I guess. Uh, our tax partner Shiva has a question for you, sir. That this is in relation to. Um, I'm able to read it. I read it out and answer. Maybe you are, you have it. Yeah, you have it in front of you. Yes, sir. Please. Yeah. Yeah. So Adil's questions. I think I changed. Which are the changes we have witnessed in here? I'll probably take a few of the questions together and try and put them together. Yeah, sure. In a company sure. structure, ESOPs is a way of deferring rewards but ensuring loyalty. But in certain professions like lawyers, there's no scope for corporatization. How do you think these professions can retain talent while also matching outflows and inflows? How helpful and necessary is a policy and exit, etc.? How good do you think is a churn for the organization? Uh, yeah, that's something that you can take that quickly. ESOPs in large organization where the, uh, the activity of today will yield results several years later is uh, going to be the, uh, I mean, that's, that's where it is uh, most applicable. Uh, but for most people, in fact, I would say for almost all the people, it's not as though the monetary rewards that may be attractive in the short term, but the longer term, the individual craves for respect. The individual craves for recognition, respect. If that is given, if that is coming, uh, then it is, uh, most people won't even worry about ESOPs. You know, that's what drives researchers. That's what drives teachers. That's what drives doctors. Many of the medical professionals saving a life and conducting a surgery. You know, I shared some of these cases that they talk about in that Child's Trust Hospital. You know, it's so fulfilling for them to say that, oh, everybody thought it was a Kawasaki disease, but I diagnosed it as a you know, COVID-related disease and cured that child. The pride that they get and the respect that they enjoy from their fraternity is invaluable to them. So, you know, ESOP is not the end of the world. ESOP is a way of I mean, attracting talent during the initial stages. You've seen the, been the head of United Way Charities and I had tremendous in both in raising funds and reaching in these types of crises. Keeping a tight fist on spending of this charitable girl, how is this raising funds a challenge? How do you encourage people? Thank you very much for the philosophic tone, very, very honest messages. From uh, SciPad, a lot of quotable lines and it struck me that the language is so equal. Thank you very much. Anita said, uh, role of significant organizational policies, what can you be an ideal approach of organizational policies compared to that? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, United Way, charities, uh, it's, it's doing work. It's again still feeding the people. We raised money for buying ventilators and distributing PPEs, which is the need of the art. And then long term also, we have plans, skills development. Uh, how do we create employment? How do you drive consumption? Things like that. So one of the things that I've started doing is focus on, you know, I was involved in far too many charitable activities. So I've now focused on United Way, anything that I want to do, uh, align it with United Way or do what United Way wants to do and adopt that as my cause also. So one other cause that I'm, uh, that I think India is not investing in sufficiently is in research and uh, new areas. New, new areas, industries of the future, industries of the future. It's not the today's industries that are going to create employment. The future industries have always been in space, in aviation, in aeronautics, in renewable energy, in pharmaceuticals and healthcare, in uh, renewable power, and maybe nuclear power, uh, and technology, in, uh, information technology, computers, quantum computing, communication equipment, etc. So, I, I, my, the philosophy that I've adopted is if I want to give away money, it's, 
it's better that I give that money to research institutions or startups, uh, which are trying to take a higher risk. And uh, you know, some of them may work, some of them may not. Maybe I'll just end by doing a little bit of a pitch for what I'm trying to do. Uh, primarily, you know, initial uh, team Indus, the team in Bangalore that was trying to spend a lunar module to the moon, spacecraft, the private sector. So along with a few other excited people, I also put my interest. That didn't come about, but that didn't stop me. The two or three other areas, I'm investing in a company from Institute of Science that's working on developing a new vaccine, a global vaccine, very interesting thought process. Uh, you know, these, these are people who have great ideas. They struggle for a couple of million dollars. That's all they need in order to get started and realize what they want to do before taking it big. So if you support them in that area of vaccine development, working with electric vehicle, battery manufacturing company, I got a chance to uh, work with Adil Kakodkar on uh, thorium-based nuclear energy, whether India can take this nuclear energy or uh, our technologies to African countries where uh, proliferation and resistant fuel is available for some of power plants. I said, okay, that's a uh, good investable idea. Yeah, it's uh, not going to see any returns from these type of investments in my lifetime, but hopefully something will happen that will help the poor. So I've taken a somewhat of a, a very, 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 very long-term view of things and focusing on those areas. I think there are uh, just a couple of more questions towards the end. Corporate social responsibility obligations increase or reduce companies. Thank you very much, insightful thoughts and culture based on person, especially I'm a millennial. Share your thoughts on how can culture virtual working environment. Uh, Arti, Arti, I mean, you shouldn't be asking these questions. You should be doing this. So I can ask, answer Vasker's questions in terms of uh, ESR money. It's, uh, it's the toughest thing. Companies are shrinking. Companies uh, are finding that you know they spent a lot of money on activities, a wash program, doing all these toilets and spending. And in the last six months, they see that everything has fallen into disrepair, no maintenance. They have to restart all over. So as a result, uh, people are beginning to ask questions about what is a sustainable way of developing. It's, it's not just giving away to some, some NGO, but it is something that uh, where you can actively get engaged in managing the program so that there is a, you know, this is something that we noticed when uh, United Way went to some of the corporates and said uh, the feeding program, feeding program is something United Way didn't participate. Because many of the corporates said, you know, feeding program, you'll keep feeding, next time there'll be a flooding, monsoon, cyclone, again you'll come back. That's, that's not what we want to do continuously. What is it that you can do for the long term? So we said ventilators. You know, let's buy and give ventilators, that'll come in handy. It is needed now, but it's not going to go away. So it will remain in hospitals for several years to come. Uh, and it's those type of causes that we do. So that's where, you know, there, there are good examples. I think there's this guy, Cash Rangan uh, from Harvard, who's got the three theater model of corporate social responsibility. That's something that many other companies are beginning to adopt. And if you have, you know, there's plenty return and available on the net that you can learn from that. Culture is, it's, it's just that the people have to exhibit that culture, exhibit the behavior, people will automatically follow. You come on time, people will come on time. Yeah, other people will just not be something. If you are lethargic, if you compromise on values, on qualities, then very soon the rest of the people are part of the organization. If you come for a meeting, right on time, everyone will. And that's the only way to permeate the culture because it's not something that you can see. You cannot put uh, new employees in a classroom and say, this is our culture. Culture is for them to learn by observing by seeing what people do. By the way, I mean, they're phenomenally good. Phenomenally good. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this conversation with all of you. Uh, sir, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I've been making notes. And so uh, penetration is profit reaches cost. I'm, I'm going to uh, copyright that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, we learned so much, sir. I, I mean, uh, having your advice, uh, having access to the kind of guidance you're giving us is, is you know, it's beyond price for all the people who are listening. And we've also recorded this and several people have asked us to, you know, play it later for them, you know, who may be in office right now. 
it is a wonderful learning experience sir thank you for sharing your valuable time with us thank you so much sir all the very best and nick once again congratulations on completing 15 years thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.